Hello and welcome to the Nutrition Diva podcast. I'm your host, Monica Reinagel, and this week I'm talking with Tamara duker freuman about leaky gut syndrome. This episode is supported by Sweetgreen. Sweetgreen is on a mission to redefine fast food with seasonal salads and bowls made from scratch with sustainably sourced ingredients. Their new menu has fresh, delicious options that will make every day feel like summer Friday, like the elodi bowl with roasted corn and peppers, the smoky blueberry summer salad, and more. Meet your new favorite summer lunches and order ahead with the Sweetgreen app. Learn more at sweetgreen.com. Several times a week, I get emails or calls on the Nutrition Diva listener line requesting an episode on leaky gut. Is this a real thing? How do you know if you have it? How can you heal or prevent a leaky gut? Well, to help me sort through what has become a veritable mountain of myth and misunderstanding, I've invited Tamara duker Freuman, a registered dietitian nutritionist who specializes in digestive disorders, back to the Nutrition Diva podcast for an encore. Earlier this year, she joined me on the podcast to talk about her book, The Bloated Belly Whisperer, in which she explains the many different possible causes of belly bloating and how to tailor an approach to your particular situation. I know that episode and the book were incredibly helpful for many of you, and if you heard it, then you know that Tamara really knows her stuff. So I can't think of a better person to help us understand this mysterious and, according to some people, extremely common thing frequently referred to as leaky gut. Welcome back to the podcast, Tamara. Thank you. So let me first just set the stage for our listeners. Leaky gut and leaky gut syndrome are terms that are thrown around a lot in certain corners of the alternative health world, and they're starting to pop up more and more on mainstream consumer health channels. And the basic idea is that something, and that might be a food or an additive or an environmental toxin or an illness or even stress, causes the cells that line the digestive tract to become inflamed and irritated. And then, as a result, the tight connections between these cells become more permeable, or in common parlance, leaky. And then, according to this theory, that allows toxins, bacteria, or partially digested food to leak out of the intestines and into circulation, where they cause all kinds of symptoms, which are collectively described as leaky gut syndrome. And those symptoms might include everything from fatigue to headaches to joint pain to an entire range of digestive symptoms. Alternative practitioners might base their diagnosis of leaky gut syndrome on your symptoms. And by that measure, essentially 75% of the population has leaky gut. Or they might even order various lab tests, urine tests, blood tests, stool tests that will allegedly confirm this diagnosis. And then the next step is a protocol to heal the gut. And these protocols typically involve eliminating from the diet various foods and food groups that are thought to be inflammatory. They might involve introducing probiotic foods or probiotic supplements, along with a host of other supplements. Now, often, but not always, people following these protocols experience relief from some of their symptoms, and that would seem to validate this approach. As is so often the case, there is a kernel of truth here, but it's surrounded by an ocean of misinformation and misunderstanding. So, Tamara, help us sort out what's what. Now, first, intestinal permeability is an actual thing, but it doesn't quite work the way I've just described it. So can you explain to us what intestinal permeability is? Sure. So intestinal permeability, or what people like to refer to as leaky gut, uh, refers to an abnormal amount of flow of stuff from inside the gut between the cells of the gut. And so to understand what it really is, you have to understand that your gut's main function in terms of digestion and uh, nutrition is to serve as a very selective barrier. Your intestine is a barrier from the outside world to the inside world so that everything from the outside doesn't just willy-nilly flow into our body, right? Don't forget, we've got trillions of bacteria living in there. They need to stay there and not have access into our bloodstream. And so the gut has a really important barrier function. Okay, the main way that things get from the outside world um, of the gut to the inside world of the body is actually through the cells of the 
gut themselves. Okay, so the cells of our gut, they're called enterocytes, and they can allow all sorts of food proteins and vitamins and minerals and nutrition into the body very selectively through the cells themselves. And that's the primary way that things from the outside world come in. But there's a secondary channel, and that is in between the cells. And so if you picture these cells kind of lined up in a column like soldiers standing tightly shoulder to shoulder, there's a little bit of room for some water, for some sodium, for some teensy-weensy little sugars to kind of flow in between the shoulders of these cells standing like soldiers shoulder to shoulder, and that is between the cells. And that is um, normal, okay? That's called paracellular transport, and that's normal as well. Intestinal permeability or leakiness refers to a situation where more than that normal amount of just a little bit of water or small sugars or sodium starts being able to flow in between those cells. That's what we mean by intestinal permeability. Now, the question is what actually happens when more than just that small normal amount of stuff flows through. There is a second barrier of defense sort of at the base of those cells because your body isn't just going to let anything flow through. If it makes it through, just come on in. So there's a second line of defense, and that's your immune system. There's all sorts of immune cells, white blood cells, kind of standing at the base of those channels at the ready as a second line of defense. And so if small fragments of bacteria or bacterial toxins or larger food molecules or food proteins that don't really belong there, if they kind of flow through those paracellular or between cell channels, they interact with those white blood cells, those immune cells, and it produces an immune reaction, which can cause some local inflammation within the gut. That's a great explanation, and I think it gives us maybe a more helpful visualization than the kinds of diagrams we might see online where you actually see little pieces of cupcake floating around in your bloodstream because it snuck through the the barrier. So do we know what causes this situation? What might give rise to intestinal permeability? So we know a few of the things, but you know, the science and the research into intestinal permeability is still really at its infancy. So there's some stuff we know and a lot more that we don't quite know. So one of the known causes of increased intestinal permeability is sort of an acute bacterial infection, Mm -hmm. food poisoning, or like a really bad bout of um, bacterial um, infections or something called C. diff, which some people get in a hospital, or certain strains of E. coli, um, toxin from contaminated food or water. And so if you have sort of an acute bacterial infection of the gut from traveler's diarrhea or food poisoning, certain bacterial toxins can cause increased intestinal permeability. So that's one pretty well-established cause. Um, As far as other causes, you know, scientists are still trying to understand cause and effect. So we see increased intestinal permeability associated with other types of diseases. For example, Crohn's disease, which is a type of inflammatory bowel disease. We also see it in association with irritable bowel syndrome and with celiac disease. But it's not clear whether those diseases cause the intestinal permeability or are caused by it. And so the the direction of that relationship is not really well understood quite yet. So to say that a poor diet might cause intestinal permeability or that just eating foods that contain gluten, if you don't have celiac disease, that that's going to lead to intestinal permeability, that sounds like that's a little bit of a, an exaggeration from what we know. I mean, it's an interesting theory, but there's no evidence to support that theory yet. So what kind of symptoms might we expect to experience if we were suffering from intestinal permeability? Maybe we had one of these bacterial infections or we suffer from one of those digestive diseases and we actually do have some increased permeability. What would we feel? What would the symptoms of that be? So it's not clear that the permeability itself actually causes any symptoms. And the reason I say that is because when scientists are studying this, for example, when they know that there's a population of people with Crohn's disease who have increased intestinal permeability, they've actually looked at first-degree relatives of these people with Crohn's disease who we know are at increased genetic risk of developing the condition. And scientists have looked at groups of these people and seen that some of them who are completely healthy, no symptoms, don't have active Crohn's disease, do have intestinal permeability. They're walking around with it. Maybe they've been walking around with it for 10 years and they're fine. Hmm. So it doesn't seem from what we know right now that the permeability itself is causing any kind of symptoms. What we do understand is that some of the medical conditions that are associated with the permeability 
do cause symptoms, whether it's active Crohn's disease or active celiac disease or a case of irritable bowel syndrome. Those conditions can cause a host of symptoms, uh, depending on the condition, right? Crohn's disease can cause diarrhea, abdominal pain, similar uh, situation with IBS. Um, celiac disease can cause nutrient deficiencies and malabsorption and bloating and gas and, and abdominal pain and diarrhea. But it's not clear that it's the permeability causing hmm. that. It's the disease. That's fascinating that they have been able to see this condition in healthy people with no symptoms at all. How do they know that they have it? How, how is this diagnosed? Oh, it's so tricky. Um, that is the million-dollar question. So researchers are still really trying to understand how do we even measure this phenomenon. Um, there are a bunch of different tests, and you know, entire papers have been written on the pros and cons of different tests. And the consensus right now is there is no one perfect gold standard tests. There are some pros and cons to different approaches. Um, and it's really recommended that if you're a researcher trying to study this in a lab, that you use a few different tests to really compare and triangulate the results. And so one of the more common tests you'll see in the research literature is something called the lactulose mannitol test, which is a urine test, where they basically, you know, give people this sugar solution to drink with two different types of sugars. Uh, lactulose, which is a giant molecule that should not be able to slip through in between those cells, and mannitol, which is a teensy-weensy sugar that in normal healthy people should be able to slip through those cells. And so they give people these drinks, and they check the urine before, and they check the urine a few hours later, and they see what is the ratio of those two sugars in the urine. If too much lactulose was able to make it through your body and get filtered by your kidneys and into your urine, we can kind of surmise that maybe there is increased intestinal permeability that allowed that lactulose to slip through. And so that's one metric, but it's not perfect. It's really flawed. You don't know the, about the variation between different people and what's normal for them at their baseline. Um, and you also don't know, um, you know, whether more sugar slipping through means that other things are slipping through too, like bacteria and food proteins. And so it's not this perfect measure in and of itself. And it has been validated for clinical use. Like you can't just go to your doctor and have a lactulose mannitol test and have intestinal permeability diagnosed. We haven't proven as a scientific community that that is, you know, an accurate foolproof measure of this phenomenon. We're just not there yet. Well, I find it interesting that you were talking about tests that can measure intestinal permeability, not tests that can diagnose intestinal permeability. Because if I understand you correctly, this is not a disease that we recognize. Correct. Intestinal permeability is not a diagnosis, and that's the difference between leaky gut and leaky gut syndrome. Leaky gut is real. Leaky gut is a phenomenon that we know of as intestinal permeability that is associated with other diseases and frankly may be implicated as in the pathogenesis or the causing, you know, cascade um, for some of these diseases. Leaky gut syndrome is not a medical condition and it is not something that is recognized as an actual disease that we would diagnose and treat. Now, that's not to say that we want to abandon all of those people who feel like they might have leaky gut syndrome to their own devices. But before we get into that, let me just take another quick break to thank our sponsors. Today's episode was also supported by ButcherBox, delivering high-quality meat that you can trust. Every month, ButcherBox delivers 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, free-range organic chicken, heritage breed pork, and wild Alaskan salmon directly to your door, all with free shipping. ButcherBox believes in providing meat with integrity. All of the livestock is humanely raised on open pastures, and there are never added hormones or antibiotics. You can choose from four curated boxes or customize your own box. One of my favorite cuts are the boneless pork chops. They are really some of the best I've ever had, definitely better than what I'm able to get from my local grocery store. Now, celebrate the start of grilling season with one of the best deals ever. To receive $20 off your first order, plus the ultimate barbecue bundle for free, go to butcherbox.com diva, or you can enter the promo code diva at checkout, and you'll get two New York strip steaks, baby back ribs, and two pounds of ground beef free in your first box, plus $20 off. Just go to butcherbox.com diva, or you can enter the promo code diva. Okay, Tamara, if leaky gut syndrome is not a legitimate diagnosis, then what is causing all of these symptoms in people who have been told that they have it? 
That's a great question. And I will say that it's not just one thing, right? And so the first thing is that if you're suffering from joint pain, headaches, you know, digestive problems, um, you know, a whole range of symptoms, it's not a given that all of these things are being caused by just one thing, right? I mean, there's a reason that you might get headaches under certain circumstances, and there may be a different reason why you have diarrhea a lot. That's, you're not necessarily always going to look for one cause to explain every, you know, creak in your body and every possible symptom you have. Um, so, Although it's very attractive to think that there might be one single explanation that if we could just take care of that, all of our problems would go away. I know it would be. And if there was just one pill that could treat it all. Um, so when a patient comes in to see me and they've been told that they have leaky gut syndrome, I'm less interested in the leaky gut aspect of it. And I'm more interested in actually hearing from a person, what do they experience on a daily basis? And I kind of look at that with a fresh, you know, clean slate, you know, fresh eyes and really try to understand what is a person's experience. And it can be a range of things. And so I've seen many patients in my practice who have been told that they have leaky gut syndrome, who have a condition called SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It can cause a lot of malaise and foggy brain and bloating and gas and weird bowel function stuff. And, and there's an actual test for that and there is a treatment for that and there are causes for it that can be addressed and remedied. Uh, and so that's one thing I've seen. Sometimes people who get lots of malaise and fatigue um, and, you know, sluggish digestion can have thyroid problems. Sometimes they get migraines as a result of a specific food trigger like to tyramine or to histamines. Um, sometimes it goes with somebody's menstrual cycle and it's more hormonal in nature. And so there are all sorts of reasons why someone could feel lousy both um, digestively and otherwise. And what is very concerning for me is that when someone is given a diagnosis of leaky gut, they're not looking for those other real causes that can be diagnosed and treated and fixed. And people waste a lot of time. They have a lot of unnecessary suffering. They waste a ton of money on supplement protocols that I think are not really useful in addressing the underlying problem. And, you know, a lot of time, energy, and suffering is lost on it. Hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about these healthy gut protocols that sometimes are circulated um, or are typically prescribed for so-called leaky gut syndrome. Why is it that sometimes they actually do seem to help? Well, look, it's going to depend on the remedy, right? And so, like, one thing I've seen patients do is they'll go on, like, a bone broth fast for, like, three days. Look, if you've got a digestive problem and you don't eat for three days you will probably stop having diarrhea and you will stop having gas. If there's nothing going into your digestive tract other than broth, it will give you some temporary relief for that three-day period and possibly for a day or two after. And so it's not surprising that not eating will make your gut symptoms temporarily feel better. Um, you know, certain times a protocol will have people eliminate entire categories of food. They give up all grains, all dairy, you know, anything that processed with sugar or food additives. And so pretty much you're eating a really simple diet of, you know, plain meat or chicken or fish and some cooked vegetables. I can think of a lot of reasons why you would feel better from kind of taking all the processed stuff out of your diet, taking high lactose dairy foods out of your diet, you know, taking um, grains out of your diet because there's a lot of, um, you know, complex carbohydrates in grains that some people find gassy. There's a lot of reasons that things can feel better when you really whittle your diet down to some plain cooked vegetables and protein. That doesn't mean your gut was leaking. Um, and so sometimes you may feel better uh, from some of these interventions, but it doesn't mean that the explanation you are given as to why has merit. And so again, as a dietitian, my job is to understand from you what you did differently from your normal diet and help you understand what was it about that that felt better. Because if it was just giving up the dairy, then maybe you can have some grains back and still continue to feel great. Uh, or if it was giving up processed foods, maybe it's because there was like this one gassy, gassy fiber in this bar you were eating every single day for breakfast. And when you got rid of that one bar, everything got better. And so sometimes you're kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater when you just eliminate lots and lots of things wholesale. And it's not sustainable for you to do that long term and maybe not even necessary. Mm, yeah, it sounds like it could be uh, more restrictive than it actually needs to be to relieve your symptoms. Still, you know, feeling better is feeling better, right? So could there be any harm to these protocols for healing, quote unquote, leaky gut syndrome? 
again, it really is going to depend on the protocol. A lot of the patients who come to me having been put on a protocol are taking literally a dozen supplements a day. And so very often the protocols involve, you know, multiple probiotics, digestive enzymes, these sort of like multi-herbal formulations. Um, and A, they're expensive, which, you know, is fine. It damages your purse, not necessarily your body. But people in our country don't realize that dietary supplements are not at all regulated. Anyone can put anything in a pill and claim that it has something that it doesn't. And there could be things in that pill that are not claimed that it does have. And so, you know, one in five cases of acute liver toxicity is caused by a dietary supplement in America. And so it's so ironic, right? Your liver is basically sort of like that last line of defense when something slips past the goalie of your intestines and gets past like that barrier and then gets past those white blood cells and it enters into this bloodstream. It quickly goes straight to the liver so that it doesn't make it into the systemic circulation. And your liver detoxes and filters and makes sure that nothing bad gets into the systemic circulation. You don't want to ruin your liver with dangerous dietary supplements. And so very ironically, sometimes over medicating yourself with unnecessary dietary supplements could do you more harm than good. Specifically to the systems of your body that you're trying to heal. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So what about those who are just interested in general in maintaining healthy gut function? That certainly seems like a worthy goal, something we should all aspire to. We know that the health of our microbiome is intimately connected with our own health. So if people just want to maintain a healthy gut, what would be your best advice? So my best advice is that we know that gut barrier function is supported by the microbiome. They help induce the cells, um, certain cells within our gut lining to produce more mucus. And mucus is a sticky physical barrier that keeps the bacteria from kind of adhering to the gut walls and, you know, potentially infiltrating. So you want a healthy mucus layer. You want, you know, healthy tight junctions. And the best way that we know to do that is to support a healthy microbiota. And the way to support a healthy microbiota is to feed them things that they like to eat so that they can grow and have lots of more microbiota babies. And (laughs) there is a lot of them and there's diversity. And so the more diverse the different types of fiber in your diet are, the more different types of species you will nourish and cultivate in your microbiota. And so this idea that you whittle down your diet to like three different foods and eliminate everything actually starves and depletes your microbiota. If your job is to create a robust defense, the best thing you could do is to eat the most diverse, plant-heavy diet that comfortably you can tolerate. That means beans and root vegetables and leafy greens and nuts and seeds and fruits. The more diverse the plant-based foods in your diet, the more diverse your gut microbiota will be. And this is why if we're trying to eat more fiber to feed our microbiome, we can't just take a fiber supplement or eat that one fiber bar every day because that is not diverse, right? That's just feeding one very selective source of fiber, and it's not going to be breeding the kind of robust, diverse population that you're describing. Absolutely. Different types of fiber nourish different types of species, and you really want that diversity of the microbial population. Now, this is probably a good place to mention that fiber and different kinds of fiber can sometimes be the source of some digestive discomfort. And that was actually one of the topics that you covered in your book, The Bloated Belly Whisperer, about how to figure out. And you just alluded to that, you know, the most uh, diverse uh, fiber-rich diet that you can comfortably tolerate and, and figuring out which sources of fiber and how much of them and in what circumstances you can comfortably tolerate them. Uh, was one of the things that you go into great detail with on your book. So if you are somebody who this all sounds great and you want to eat more fiber and you want to incorporate more grains and legumes, but they make your belly hurt, then I need to point you to uh, tomorrow's book, The Bloated Belly Whisperer, for more help. And you can check that out at bloatedbellywhisperer.com. Or you can follow tomorrow on Facebook and Twitter. And of course, we'll have links in the show notes for today's episode to all of that. And those show notes, as always, are at quickanddirtytips.com. Tamara, thank you so much for joining me once again on the podcast. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm so glad to be able to tap your expertise on digestive health, especially on a topic that is so widely misunderstood. Thank you for inviting me back. The Nutrition Diva Show is produced by Nathan Semmes. Our senior editor is Karen Hertzberg. Morgan Ratner heads up audience development. Michelle Margulis runs our advertising. Kathy Doyle is our director. And we're also grateful to Emily Miller and Mikaela Prell. 
Thanks to our sponsors for helping us bring you this show, and thanks to you for listening. I'll be back next week with some new research on how your sleep habits affect your appetite and your weight, and more, and more importantly, what you can do to improve your sleep. In the meantime, have a great week, and remember to eat something good for me. Thank you.